Um, so we are in a sermon series called Build the Hearth, and um, I have the pleasure of speaking on Moses and his burning bush. Um, I think this is definitely one of the most well-known stories of the Bible. And um, in case you guys don't know, I'm going to tell you guys just a little Michaela vamp up of like what it actually is, right? Um, Moses was born in a time where all the Israelites men, um, all the Israelite men that were born were supposed to be killed, like, like killed, like as soon as out of the womb, killed. And Moses' mom was like, no, nah, you want to go get my child, right? So she's hiding him for a bit, and he's getting a little cranky, he's getting a little loud, and she's like, I don't know what to do. So she sends him down this river um, in a basket, inevitably led to uh, Pharaoh's daughter, right? Now Pharaoh's daughter actually names him Moses and brings him up in this privileged home. But as you see he's growing up, he starts to realize how awful and how brutal the slavery of his own Israelites are going to be, to the point where one day he gets enraged by this brutality and actually murders this, um, this Egyptian whipping this Israelite, right? So at this time, he is absolutely terrified. He's shocked. He didn't know what came over him. And so he starts running in, like around the wilderness for 40 years, until one day when he saw um, a bush on fire, right? Now, you can imagine how Moses is feeling, right? 40 years ago, he killed a man. I'm pretty sure there's no inner healing curriculum back then. So you can imagine he is like suffering like beyond disbelief. I don't know how he's, I don't know how he's eating food. I don't know how he's drinking water, but he's just getting it done, okay? Now, so you can tell that God is showing up amidst his suffering. And it still happens today, by the way, right? So if I can give an example, um, I know this beautiful young woman by the name of Jessica Cartwright. And some of you guys know her um, or of her and of her story, but um, it's just something that's really inspired me today. Now, I grew up kind of around her. She used to go to our old church and we were kind of family friends and she was close with my mom and it was great. It was all great and then 2020 came around. Now, you hear 2020 and immediately there are things that come to your mind, right? Obviously COVID, masks, isolation, um, not going anywhere, um, suicide rates went up, depression rates went up, phone usage went up. And if you guys were in, at, were in school at that point, your grades, I'm telling you, it could not just be me. They were going down. Okay, so while y'all were worried about your phone usage and I was worried about how my grades are like drowning, right? We look over to see one of our friends, Miss Cartwright, dealing with, a, um, with her husband being sick. Now he had, um, for what I understand, like a, diff like a bunch of different um, medical issues, but COVID put him in the ICU. And now at this time, I'm hearing about this, and what I hear is that during this time, Ms. Cartwright, she's going outside of the hospital, because at this time, you couldn't just be in the hospital with your family member while they're sick. You like have to be in like complete like head suit, hazmat suit, like it was just a whole thing, and you couldn't have any really other visitors. So at this time, she stands outside of the hospital inviting her friends, her family, her community to come and pray for him, right? She's declaring for his health, saying, in the name of Jesus, Caleb will be healed, right? And she's saying this over and over. And as an eighth grader at this point, I'm inspired. I'm like, whoa, like this is happening. And like she has no control over it. And she's giving it to the person who has complete control out of it, right? And now... During this time, um, actually, in Exodus 3.2, when we talk about the burning bush, right, the NIV version says that there the angel of the Lord appealed, appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. Now, you can imagine, right, Miss Cartwright, she is, her entire world is burning up. Right? Like, think, like, I'm not married, okay, but think of your spouse, right? Think of these situations where you're hearing about this illness that's killing thousands of people at this point, and you have no idea if your spouse is next. That is terrifying. That is absolutely terrifying. So you can assume at this point her entire world is engulfed in flames, 
but her soul still stayed intact. Because if you look at it, she's giving all, everything that she has to the only person that can control her situation. And this was beautiful. But then one day as I was coming home in the car, I see a video of her and she's explaining how her husband had died. Now as an eighth grader, I was already mad. I was sad, I didn't know what to do, I didn't really know how to process her feelings and before I can even really go into what does this mean and all that different stuff, she looks straight into the camera and she goes, it is well. See, just because God doesn't show up in a way that you envisioned him to, in the way you expected him to, in the way that you wanted him to, it doesn't mean that he was never really there. God still mourns for us when we're going through hard things, even when he puts us through them, especially when he puts us through them. He cares about our feelings and he wants us to be happy because his will actually does line up with our happiness. He says that he does everything for our good and don't you think that includes our happiness? Now, even though we go through tough times and God puts us through those tough times, it doesn't mean that we don't need people around us. Because as I said before, she had a community with her. She had a community crying with her and praying for her and feeling for her and with her during this entire situation. She would not have been able to heal the way that she did, and she is still healing, right? She wouldn't be able to be going through this healing process without them. Now, if we go back to the story of Moses, right? Moses was also given someone to commune with by God. Now, if you like are familiar with the burning bush story, God's like, hey, I'm going to need you to like help deliver the Israelites. And he's like, nah, bro. He's like, I can't. Like, I got to stutter. Like, um, all this different stuff, X, Y, Z. No, don't make me do it. And God was like, did I stutter? <laughs> like, did I ask? Like, I didn't. And so Moses is like complaining and he's arguing and all this different stuff. And then Exodus 4, 14 through 17, it says that then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Now, just a reminder, God's not going to ask us, put us through, or, yeah, he's not going to ask us to do something, make us do something, or put us through something that we're not going to be able to handle, right? He cares, whoa, turn it around. <laughs> um, he Moses felt like he really needed someone to be alongside him in this situation. And even though God knew and was very confident in Moses' ability to continue and go by himself, he needed a community to help him and support him through this time. Later on, right, he sends, God sends Aaron, and Aaron's speaking for him and all this different stuff. But if you kind of like skip a few chapters, you start realizing that Moses is starting to stand up for himself right? He's starting to speak. He's starting to declare. He's starting to tell, Mo tell Pharaoh, like, bro, like, help us out, right? And God knew he had the ability to do it, but it took Aaron to be alongside him for, be for him to be able to do it, right? Our community helps us get through things that we're unsure of uh, handling, and it's important to keep in mind what kind of community we have around us. Because Moses' brother being able to be there and being with him and support him through this situation was really important for him to get the Israelites where they later were into the promised land. Um, so speaking of community, I'm going to bring up Natalie and she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, 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 community. I have to say, well, first I have to find my spot. Hold on. There it is. Um, I am so encouraged and excited about what is happening here at The Rock. <laughs> God knew. I know he did because he wrote this message. 
And it was definitely written before last weekend. So, so good. Um, yeah, Michaela is just so spot on that, you know, God calls us to do things and we get to have a personal relationship with him, right? And we get to hear what he wants us to do, but then he also calls people to come into our, um, into our lives to help through those things. So, you know, when you say yes to Jesus, you're also saying yes to being a part of his body. And we want to make sure that that body is healthy and that we are a healthy part of that body. So, you know, as I was praying about what the Lord wanted me to speak, this table is so tall because I'm so short. Um, I kept coming back to that picture that Dr. John first used and then um, Pastor Ken used of the upper room with all of the people waiting on Jesus' word. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just lights them all on fire, right? And so it's this whole room of just people lit on fire. And, um, you know, that's what you need. If you want to keep your fire burning bright, if you want to keep yourself on fire, then you need to surround yourself with people that are also on fire. Um, yeah, so the definition community is people who are gathered together who have a common background, interest, or cause. Uh, that's all of us, right? So, um, yeah. So in Acts 2, 42 through 47, I'm just going to read it because honestly, it is exactly what we need. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke homes and ate together with glad and sincere those who were being saved. All right, so what does this say? Let's talk about the first thing it says. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Well, that's easy. Luckily for them, they got like, you know, firsthand stuff. And we actually also get firsthand stuff if you read your Bible. Because that's exactly what it is. It's the apostles' teaching. So open up your Bible, get familiar with it. But then share it with other people who are believers. Because here's what, what happens when you do that. You get an interpretation of what the Lord is speaking to you about certain scriptures. But then when you speak with others, the Lord has put something different on their heart. And so you get a more rounded um, perception of what God is speaking to or speaking about through those scriptures. Um, okay, two, fellowship and breaking bread. That's easy. Opening up to others in a vulnerable way. That's easy, right? It wasn't for me, that's for sure. It took years and years of the Lord stripping me of the control that I had over you know, myself and my situations for me to actually allow other people in. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a lesson in trust, but it's something that if you want to be part of a healthy community, it's definitely something that needs to happen. Um, three, prayer. So standing in agreement with one another and warring in prayer. Um, having people around you that have a prayer-filled life will ramp up your prayer life. And it, this is so important um, in 2020, it's so funny that you spoke about 2020, it was quite a year, um, our daughter ended up in the hospital with encephalitis. And um, she was non-responsive, she didn't recognize us, um, and they were telling us that it was gonna be months and months of hospitalization. And immediately, the first thing we did was contact our community, our friends, our family, and ask them to start praying because we didn't believe that and we weren't going to accept it. But when a doctor is telling you this is how it is, you know, it's hard to just be like, no, that's not what it's going to be like. But we knew if our friends were praying for us, if it, then it was going to not happen, right? So, yeah, so that is very important. Okay, the fourth thing is uh, filled with awe about signs and wonders being performed. Um, so, a lot of times this is a scary one for people, you know, when people start prophesying, speaking in tongues, uh, when miracles break out and things happen that 
you can't explain, but those are the things that we need to be in, in anticipation for. What happened last weekend was a sign and wonder. It was a miracle. To have people come out of their seats and say yes to Jesus and I'm ready to get dunked in that water in my clothes, that was a sign and wonder. And every single person who was here to witness that was a part of a community. We are a community. And when we can stand and clap and cheer and, and be in anticipation of those signs and wonders and say, yes, Lord, do it again, that is a sign of a healthy community. When Paisley was in the hospital, um, <laughs> like I said, they were telling us it was going to be months. And we had one night, our friend's kids had prayed over voice text. And so Carrie was taking nights and I was taking days because, because and so um, that night Carrie played the recording for Paisley of the prayer from her friends immediately yes. Come on. immediately Come on. she was aware on. she was awake Come on. she was lucid she knew who Carrie was yeah. and you know the doctors were calling her an anomaly but we know what that means in science speak. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It wasn't. It was days she was. Stop it. it was days. That is a miracle. And all of our community watched that happen. And it gives you hope, right? It gives you hope for your own situations. Number five is being together and having everything in common. Having people to relate to, having people to challenge you in the situations that you're going through, whether it's marriage, kids, job, um, whatever it is, having people around you who are going through the same thing gives you hope and it gives you support. So it's important to make sure you, know, you have to give a little bit of yourself up, right? In order to relate to somebody, you have to relay what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your life with other people, and they have to do the same. So that's an important part of community. Um, let's see here. Number six. And realistically, probably not. Um, bring us meals to bring our family meals to stay overnight the night stay overnight at our house because I was not leaving the hospital even though Carrie was the night caretaker I was in the parking lot in my van I was not leaving so you know we had people doing our laundry it was just a, a group of people who loved us who came together to say what do you need whatever I have I will give you to help you out in any way possible. That's what it looks like. It doesn't look like, you know, sell, sometimes it does, I'm gonna say this. Sometimes it does look like selling your house, but not always. Sometimes it just means asking the Lord, what, what should I give? And then doing it, because it's gonna be uncomfortable. Because you wanna give this much, but God is always gonna ask you to give this much. So, just be prepared for that. <laughs> all right did I say that one yeah okay so number seven glad and sincere hearts okay so this is hard especially in this day and age it is so easy for us to focus on the negative but our heart posture our heart posture is where it's at and community can help us with that because I can tell you right now that um anytime that that I am going down that negative route, my friends are telling me to renew my mind. And that's not an easy thing um, to do, but it's the one thing that is so important is to just continually keep your mind on Jesus because no matter what we're going through or what we've had to sacrifice, I can tell you he's sacrificed more. Yeah, come on. And if you think about that, like he, he's just done so much for us. Praising God. This can look like I do that, whether, whether it is a worship song, a scripture, um, a prophetic word, or just an encouraging word, it's always going to be pointed back to Jesus. 
and <laughs> yeah, if you're constantly being pointed back to Jesus, then you can't, you can't veer your thoughts in any other way but to Jesus. Enjoying the favor of all the people, championing everyone with no comparison or rivalry. I think that this is where we get community wrong. And it's because the enemy loves to run against us, right? If somebody over there is doing better than us, we're not thinking, yes, good job. A little part of us is like, well, why can't I have that, right? But that's where we have to really fight. We have to really fight and say yes for our fellow family members in our community. I can tell you right now that the Lord has been speaking to me about doing this for years Years he's been like, you're supposed to have that mic. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. But it wasn't until I had community behind me, um, encouraging me, reminding me who I was and what the Lord has put in me and to re really just focus on like my identity in Christ that I'm even able to be up here. Having Having people in your corner and having people cheer you on is, is super important. And cheering other people on and focusing on other people's fortune, it changes your heart and it changes your mind. So then that does something to your brain and your heart. So a good a good healthy community first starts with ourselves, right? Like you can't have a healthy community if everybody's only thinking about everybody else and not looking at themselves. So our heart posture and our why for wanting community in the first place is very important. Do we want to be a part of something better than ourselves? Do we want to be where God has Or Are we looking for people to fill a need that only God can fill? People are people. And they will never be able to do for you what God can do for you what God can bring you wholeness, right? That's what we all want. We want wholeness. And people aren't going to do that, but they can help you. Here are some questions to ask yourself about whether or not you are healthy and looking at community in a healthy way. Are you teachable? And be honest with yourself. You know, this is what I want. True. Think about it. Are you teachable? Are you willing to learn how God wants you to live and then do it? Are you correctable? That one's really hard. Are you willing to learn? No. Are you um, willing to trust someone? And, you know, when they come and challenge you, are you willing to look at yourself? and change what needs to be changed? And are you humble? Are you willing to say I'm not perfect, nor do I have everything figured out and I make mistakes? Because these are the things that are gonna happen when you come into community, you're gonna be faced with the things that you need to work on. And that's not in any way, shape, or form comfortable. It's hard. But it's what needs to happen if you want to grow in the Lord and you want to become whole. And the people in your community are the ones that are going to be there throughout that process. So having a healthy community brings unity. It brings accountability. It gives you a place to be yourself. And know that as all of you have the same goal, you're safe to learn and to grow. And it's easy, right? It's easy to see other people in their communities and saying, oh, God's really moving over there, right? Look at, they're all thriving and, and you know, filled with the Holy Spirit. Gosh, you know, that community is really awesome, right? Or, you know, looking at, at stuff like that and saying, gosh, I really wish I had that. We can all have that. If you want it, you have to be it. If you want a healthy community, you have to be a healthy community. And that means looking at yourself and saying, okay, what does God need to change in me so that I can be there for them? Right? We can do it. 
I know we can do it. <laughs> so yeah. What else here? I think that was it. <laughs> it is definitely not easy. It takes a lot of work. I've been in, let's see. I started following the Lord in 2003. And I have been in several communities, um, some healthy, some not so healthy. And I understand where church wounds can come from. It's really easy to be wounded by people because people are not Jesus. And so um, as we're moving forward as a community and we're growing closer to God and each other, I just want us to remember that none of us are Jesus. And so we have to come to each other with a measure of grace and a measure of mercy as we learn about each other and as we grow as people. Be open to others coming alongside you and helping you work through whatever it is that you're working through. There are people in this building that understand what you're going through. There are people in this building that want to come alongside you. So as I finish up, I just want you guys to, to really pray about what community looks like to you. And remember that your expectations need to be what God has told you and not necessarily what, just what you expect of other human beings. Because if that's the case, then it won't work. But if we're focusing on God's expectations, if we're focusing on what the Lord has asked of us and of others, then that's where we get a healthy community. So I think that that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if our worship team can just come back. We're going to enter into a, just a time of ministry here. Um, just to put a, a bow on this today. Um, I think the burning bush, um, gosh, there's so many different ways to preach Moses' story. But I think that burning bush moment that he experienced says a lot about God, but also says a lot about what God intends to do in us. Because if you're familiar with his story, Moses, as he was in this wilderness for 40 years, he knew he was a deliverer. He knew that God had called him to something great. But he found himself in this wilderness for 40 years. I mean, he was a shell of himself. I mean, here's, here's a man who has the, the first five books of the Bible inside of him. And yet he's in a wilderness cleaning up sheep boo-boo for his father-in-law, right? I mean, he is like at the lowest of low moments. And I think some of us in here understand that very well. But what if the biggest miracle wasn't necessarily that there was a bush that was on fire that wasn't consumed? What if the biggest miracle was the fact that Moses turned aside because when you, when you uh, really look into that, that phrase of Moses turning aside, it actually means that he took a detour, that he had to do something different out of the norm. He saw something out of the corner of his eye and he had to respond. And it was him responding that changed everything. Because as he stepped to this burning bush and he began to get closer to this burning bush, he started to notice and there's something about this. This is not normal, right? And a burning bush, in short, all a burning bush is, it's like a, a paradigm bomb, right? The way that he thought about the, the ways that the properties of that would work was just not working. And I want to tell you today, that is exactly the way God works. That many of us, if, if we want to be honest, we think we've got God figured out. And I'm just telling you, we don't. I don't. We don't have them figured out. And so sometimes it takes you having to get into a burning bush moment where God has to show you, yeah, you thought this about me, but I'm here to show you something different. And if you're here today 
and you think you've got God figured out, you think you've had it nailed, today I'm asking you as your brother, as your friend, turn aside. What we also see is that as he approached this bush, as he began to get closer, at some point God cut him off and said, all right, all right, my guy, my guy, no closer. Take off your shoes. And there's something about that moment. Taking off his shoes meant that he had to, and this is just the way I interpret it, all right, being a shoe guy, all right. (laughs) You ever have that friend, that friend whose house you went to, maybe this is your house, but that friend whose house you went to, and in order to, to, to go into their house, you had to take your shoes off to go into their house, right? And did you, did you understand what was happening in that moment, right? That, that your friend had parents that valued you, but did not value the dirt that was on your shoes. And so they said, you can come in, but you can't come in dirty. And so I'm just wondering if there's anyone in the house today who needs to step out of the dirt to come near. If that's you, turn aside, take your shoes off, because right now you're on holy ground. So will you stand with me? Now, Sean, how does this work with community? I'm gonna try to figure this out. Um, You know, Moses didn't really wanna do this. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to run. God gave him his brother and he went. And so there's something about community. You know, um, so many of the sins that we deal with, all of the sins we deal with, with, like that's you, okay? That's you. So many of the problems in your life is a result of your sin. Amen? Okay. That's, That's not a hot take, okay? The problems in your life is a result of your sin. But can I tell you this? Loneliness is the one problem that you have in your life that is a problem because you were made in the image of a triune God. It's the one problem you have that is not a result of your sin, which is to say it this way. You and I may have 99 sin problems, but loneliness ain't one. And you need a community to help you because the reality is this, that Christians, that that a real believer is a burning bush. When she talked about our friend Jessica Cartwright, Jessica is a burning bush. Why? Because her life was on fire, but she was not consumed. And so if you're here today and maybe your life's on fire, but you're saying, Sean, I don't want to be consumed any longer. The time is now for you to respond. Amen. And so we're just going to go into a, a few minutes of ministry. I'm going to call uh, Aaron Ford. Um, one thing I, I do want to say is, um, you know, what the Lord is doing in this house is significant. Um, I spent the whole week just marveling at what God's doing in this house. Because there's things that maybe you saw last week, but there's probably things you didn't see. And one of the things that I just took before the Lord this week is there there were people who were, you know, you you guys saw it, we were running out of towels, all right? And we had people taking their cardigans off and their sweaters off to give it to people. And I'm just telling you, it's not normal. It's not normal. And so I just believe we're in a moment right now. And if we would just linger a little bit longer like Moses did, I believe God can do something amazing. Amen.